day, everybody. Good morning, everybody, for some, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Miles Cyril, scientist and national educator for CV Sciences. It's my pleasure to discuss the endocannabinoid system today in the context of immune function, stress management, adrenal health, so on and so forth. There's a lot to get to today. I'm a big science nerd. I understand that Fullscript uh, is primarily based out of Canada. I live in the Boston area, but I actually got my master's of science at McGill University in Montreal. I'm not a practitioner, uh, but I, I have a deep love of the science and translating how we can use natural products into helping people overall. I'm just hearing a little bit of background noise. I don't know if that's from another one of the um, organizers or something, I apologize, but let's get into this. Now, we are just working with um, full script for the first time. And the reason for that is that CV Sciences is a company that built ourselves in the natural products industry based on hemp extracts and hemp derived CBD products. And if you're not aware, CBD is still technically not a lawful dietary supplement, which is the primary reason why companies like uh, full script uh, choose not to carry uh, plus CBD from us. So we have developed a whole range of new products that are meant to target the immune system that are without CBD. But I do believe they still support the endocannabinoid system, and we're going to be talking about that today. But briefly, before I go any further, I want to introduce the idea of who we are as a CBD company. Uh, because there's so many different hemp extract companies out there, CB Sciences publishes uh, more science on our hemp extract than any other CBD supplement company out there. Uh, we were the first in the industry to achieve generally recognized a safe status for our hemp extract. We recently this summer got published uh, in the Journal of Dietary Supplements, uh, peer reviewed articles on adverse event reporting, uh, a randomized controlled trial focusing on hemp extracts compared to placebo, and a study looking at the composition of the hemp extract. So that's sort of like who we are as the core. The sciences in our name, CV Sciences, is, is, is true, if you will. And just as we ease into this presentation, I also wanna highlight that in this title card here, these are all real people that helped to build this company. These aren't stock photos, okay? You know, my bosses, my friends are in this uh, title card over here. And if you have any more questions on uh, CBD, feel free to ask me uh, at any other point. You can email me, um, miles.surreal at cvsciences.com. But today the focus is on immune health and for very good reason. And I'm going to start by reading you this quote that I love from the New England Journal of Medicine. We must realize that in our crowded world of almost 8 billion people, a combination of altered human behaviors environmental changes, and inadequate global public health mechanisms now easily turn obscure animal viruses into existential human threats. I am not here to give any type of treatment suggestions for any diseases. And if I mention COVID, it is for educational purposes only. I want to be clear about that. But it's on everybody's mind right? I'm sure. I mean, just the, the news from the weekend alone, right? So there's going to be some underlying themes here without me saying anything explicitly necessarily. Please keep that in mind. I do especially want to talk about the relationship between stress and immune function, because if there is one area where we can better our health is by balancing our stress response, our adrenal response. Now, I understand that most of you listening are practitioners, um, so some of this might sound a little bit redundant for you. I will try to get through it quickly. The immune system is designed, or not designed, <laughs> is evolved to protect against uh, internal threats, um, microbes, bacteria, viruses, etc. Whereas the, I like to think of the stress system, if you will, the adrenal system, uh, as protecting us against external threats, such as that we evolved it uh, for helping us in a fight or flight state, either fight against something like a tiger, imagine yourself as a hunter-gatherer 10,000 years ago and you're picking berries, 
um, you're probably going to run away. You're going to flight away from, the, um, you know, a large cat that's attacking you. You're probably not going to fight it. But we need that stress response in order to help us get the heck away. Now, the immune system in many ways is diametrically opposed to the stress response. And the reason for this is that both systems require huge amounts of energy. And if you've ever had the flu before, you will know that sometimes you're just too unwell to have the energy to get up and reach for a cup of water. It's because your immune system requires all of the cellular energy in order to effectively mount uh, a defense against um, the invading pathogen. Similarly, the stress response, the fight or flight response, also requires a huge amount of energy in order to facilitate your fighting or flighting. And the imbalances between the allocation of energy between one system or the other, uh, if one system perhaps is chronically activated, if stress is chronically activated, it can rob immunity of the energy it needs in order to function properly. So in this way, um, stress can kind of fuel inflammation, which we can think of as an overextension of certain aspects of immune function by kind of throwing out a balance, this, this delicate seesaw, if you will. Now, I probably don't need to uh, go over uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis for you all. Um, you know, I'm sure that this is pretty well covered already. What I do like to highlight is that cortisol is so good as a stress hormone at shutting down the immune system to provide the body with enough energy to mount uh, an effective fight or flight response that it has been developed as pharmaceuticals, right? That you can use it to effectively shut down an immune response in the form of a rash on the skin, for example. So this is the point that I wanted to make, is that stress hormones shut down the immune system so that you can run for your life. And that we did not evolve to be under fear conditions 24 hours a day. But that's exactly what's happening in these modern times, that especially at the beginning of, let's say, spring or something, right? You turn on the TV and you're receiving all of this crazy news and rising numbers and et cetera, that, has, uh, that induces a fight or flight fear response in a lot of people, even if they're not in physical danger in that moment. A paper tiger might be attacking them, not a real tiger. A paper tiger is causing a fear response, a spike in cortisol, and uh, ultimately that could lead to a diminished immune response. And then people get stressed out, they're not sleeping well, their melatonin goes out of balance, and all of this really contributes to somebody having an imbalanced stress immune response. I love this graph over here that shows how kind of a normophysiologic response would look in terms of stress. The, as a result of physical stress, mental stress, oxidative stress, et cetera, you have a normal response by the HPA axis, a normal adrenal response, and cortisol is released. It blocks inflammation, it blocks immune cell activity. But let's say that goes on for a couple of days. Now we're seeing the adrenals trying to pump out more, you know, maybe not a couple of days, a couple of weeks, et cetera. The adrenals are trying to pump out more and more cortisol uh, in order to deal with the perceived threat. And immune cells eventually will stop listening to that response. Cortisol resistance can start to build up. Cortisol resistance starts to build up, then the immune cells might start to permit um, various infectious types of uh, you know, microbes or whatever to at a low grade invade the body. There might be an increase in leaky gut or in intestinal permeability. Um, and that can sort of lead to a decoupling of the normal physiologic response between stress and immunity, where ultimately you're seeing an enhanced inflammation due to chronic stress because the immune cells are gonna start and go and do whatever they want without listening to the stop response from cortisol. And we see this not just in a theoretical manner, but in a clinical manner too. I really like this paper that was published in the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology. Associations of salivary cortisol levels with inflammatory markers. Socioeconomic and psychosocial factors have been found to be associated with systemic inflammation. 
Persons with higher levels of interleukin-6 inflammatory cytokine had less pronounced cortisol awakening response, a less steep daily decline, and higher cortisol throughout the day overall. And by the way, IL-6 is one of these cytokines that is associated with uh, lung tissue damage and the cytokine storm with some of the infectious viruses that are out there. So I think it's a little bit telling that kind of a decoupled stress immune response um, can lead to some of these, or it perhaps be the foundation uh, for worsening pathologies when it comes to various uh, respiratory viruses. But I wanna broaden the scope a little bit. And if we're talking about any pandemic, we're not talking about just one feature. And I think that that is what is kind of missing from the current conversation, uh, especially in the mainstream. And I wanna bring up this idea of diet. I wanna bring up this idea of poverty and race. And I really appreciate the research of uh, the epidemiologist, Dr. Robert Flelove. And uh, he's published a couple of articles recently. Uh, one of them is on the planetary diet as chronic disease prevention. He also published an article on racism in America as contributing to one of the reasons why people of color are um, dying more frequently of the uh, COVID-19 in the current pandemic. Uh, and all of this might have to do with access to care, access to healthcare, poverty, healthcare infrastructure. Uh, and then diet and lifestyle style choices really add into this. You know, how much are you exercising? Why is it that um, people with higher BMIs or, or with more obesity appear to have a greater risk of um, comorbidities with infectious respiratory viruses? Um, and when you take all of that together, and especially the mental health component, uh, which there's a little bit of a feedback loop here, the, the virulence of any specific virus uh, it's R not. it's how much it spreads from one person to the other. It's kind of like uh, the cherry on, on top of the ice cream when it comes to how deadly something like a pandemic can be. And I, I think that's really important to think of is the kind of intersectional nature of what we're dealing with right now. So I'm, of course I'm not saying that, you know, if you change any one of these things, you're gonna have an instant fix. But where we think, uh, you know, good nutrition, good supplementation, good integrative and naturopathic practices can help is by feeding the immune system, is by altering the relationship between stress and immune function, by using lifestyle and meditation and good sleep hygiene to kind of stop the mental health imbalances or help to soften how people feel stress. Because if they're stressed out about what's happening in the world, then that is ultimately going to be leading to them to have a weakened immune response that might worsen what's happening in the world and then that becomes kind of a vicious cycle. So we have to break that cycle. And um, this is where I think, you know, these integrative approaches are really quite wonderful. Now I wanna go back to the biochemistry for a little bit. You know, if we distilled everything I just mentioned in the past you know, 15 minutes into, um, you know, one or two slides, we have our seesaw, stress and immunity. Stress shuts down the immune systems that you can run through life. Well, these are both two critical physiologic systems that we've evolved that have necessary roles at necessary times. And if they're activated inappropriately in unnecessary times or for too long or too short, then you have a problem. But there is a third system that alters the fate of both stress and immune function. And this is called the endocannabinoid system. And if you've heard of endocannabinoid system, feel free to uh, drop it in the chat. If you haven't heard of it, um, you know, write it down. And, you know, so I really want to spend some time now talking about the system uh, in the context of it a, being able to allocate energy between either stress or immunity. And what I mean by that, well, let's let's talk about a quote from one of my favorite uh, scientists, actually, um, just because the research that Dr. Vincenzo DiMarzo has done, it, I find so fascinating, uh, is that in 1998, Dr. DiMarzo wrote that the endocannabinoid system helps our body relax, eat, sleep, protect, and forget. Endocannabinoid system regulates the function of uh, cortisol in some circumstances. 
regulates the function of certain cytokines and other inflammatory or immunogenic mediators. Endocannabinoid system is involved with storing and burning energy, lipogenesis throughout the body. Uh, if you've ever consumed cannabis and you got high, you got the munchies, you've experienced the increased food seeking behavior and energy storage that cannabis might be uh, inducing by activating endocannabinoid system. So this system is deeply involved and it controls a number of immunological, neurological, and metabolic fates in the body, which is why I am suggesting that it is a crucial third system that controls the fate of either stress or immune activity. It might be helpful in mediating the relationship between these two systems. Now, why is it called endocannabinoid system? And the reason why it's called endocannabinoid system is that they discovered the receptors and the system after they discovered the plant molecules. They named it kind of backwards, if you will. What I mean to say is that it was Dr. Raphael Meshulam of Hebrew University who elucidated the chemical structures of the major plant cannabinoids, CBD and THC, in 1963 and 1964. And for decades, they had no clue how THC worked at all. They thought, well, you know, this is a fatty, uh, fat-loving molecule, it's lipophilic, maybe it disrupts the cell membrane, uh, kind of like how alcohol can disrupt the cell membrane and, and cause a change in GABAergic transmission. They just didn't know how it worked. And in 1988, uh, Dr. Alin Howlett found that we actually produce our own cannabinoid receptors and that they're extremely abundant in the brain, which then led Mishulam's lab to say, well, wait a minute, if we have our own receptors, we probably wouldn't evolve them just for plant molecules. Um, and it turns out that's a great coincidence of nature that we produce our own endogenous cannabinoids. And from a chemical perspective, they look nothing like the plant cannabinoids. So Dr. Raphael Mishulam, who elucidated the structure of THC, basically discovered our body's own version of THC. Uh, they named it anandamide in 1992. And anandamide um, basically is a reference to the Sanskrit word for bliss, joy, heart, ananda. So this is like our bliss molecule here uh, that Dr. Mishulam and colleagues discovered. You'll notice that this is a lipid signaling molecule. The endocannabinoid system is in many ways an extension of the acosinoid system. And the fate of many endocannabinoids is to actually get converted back into arachidonic acid or other uh, fatty acids that may then get converted into prostaglandins or leukotrienes. This is a very closely related system. Endocannabinoid system I like to think of as a three-legged stool that comprises uh, G-protein coupled receptors, membrane bound, widely expressed throughout the body, lipid signaling molecules that are fatty acid amides, such as anandamide. What I mean by that is that there's an ethanolamine group here uh, tied to arachidonic acid, or acylglycerols, like 2-AG, uh, is arachidonic acid tied to a uh, diglycerol. And then there are the enzymes that build up these compounds as well as break them down. This is the three-legged stool of the endocannabinoid system. So when I say endocannabinoid system, uh, it's a, a little bit analogous, not just to acosinoids, but even something like a neurotransmitter system like serotonin, where again, you have receptors, you have ligands, serotonin, and you have the enzymes and transporters that can build up serotonin and it's involved with its synaptic release, et cetera. And by the way, serotonin is involved in immune cells and other uh, tissues too. It's not just a neurotransmitter. Same with endocannabinoids. The endocannabinoid system, you can find cannabinoid binding one receptor and cannabinoid binding two receptor present all throughout the body. Uh, lungs, liver, skin, uh, gut, all layers of the gut, um, many aspects of the brain, many areas of the nervous system, it's very, very widely expressed. And it's not just CB1 and CB2 receptor. Uh, they're currently investigating a CB3 receptor, maybe. It's currently referred to as an orphan receptor. Uh, there are also 
various players within the greater endocannabinoid dome, and there are endocannabinoid-like molecules that interact with these receptors, although not uh, orthosterically, not directly binding to those receptors, but working on them in kind of an entourage, more allosteric type of way. So it's actually very complicated. Um, there's a lot of potential configurations and therefore roles for physiology when it comes to mediating this cellular system. So kind of the two principal endocannabinoids that are best studied are anandamide and 2-AG. Although we're also going to be talking a lot about PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide, which our body produces and as you can see, it looks similar to anandamide. It has an ethanolamine group, uh, but it's based on palmitic acid instead of arachidonic acid. And because of this, it doesn't directly bind to uh, either CB1 or CB2 receptors. Uh, it, instead, it might alter the tone of endocannabinoids through some other cellular mechanisms. And I kind of want to highlight here that there are many potential endocannabinoids that your body will, will build. If you think about it, in the serotonin system, you have one ligand, serotonin, and seven different serotonin receptors. With the endocannabinoid system, that paradigm is reversed. You have dozens of different endocannabinoids and only one or two receptors. And the reason being is that your body will take fatty acids such as arachidonic acid, even omega-3s, DHA, EPA, et cetera, and kind of combine them with different uh, glycerols, different amino acids, different biogenic amines, even neurotransmitters. So your body will go through great lengths to produce stuff like uh, anandamide, uh, or produce uh, arachidineal dopamine, DHA serotonin addicts, and each one of these have a very specific character uh, affinity for binding to the receptors. Uh, it kind of creates a different type of physiologic response. And that's what makes studying endocannabinoid system so uh, fascinating and infuriating <laughs> because any little change could create a different effect. And there's so many potential for changes. But the major overarching theme here is in the blue circle, you have the uh, lipid constituent, your arachidonic acid, omega-6, your omega-3, uh, your omega-9, so on and so forth. And then in the red circle is uh, what your body will take to glue to that, um, the acyl or the, the uh, glycerol, the amine, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what does our body do with this stuff? Essentially, these endocannabinoids are produced in extremely small amounts. We're talking like picomolar, nanomolar amounts, and they exist temporally for maybe seconds to minutes, like that. They work to kind of homeostatically alter a function within a local cellular milieu. It's not like a hormone that travels all across the body like cortisol or a cytokine. It works within a very small tissue-based area, sometimes in an autocrine or a paracrine manner. I like to think of endocannabinoids a little bit like um, controlling the knob on a hot air balloon with the stated evolutionary goal of kind of keeping your body, uh, that local cellular tissue, in a healthy range. Too much, too little, might lead, lead to a disease state. We're gonna talk about that. Too much or too little endocannabinoid activity or tone or receptor expression is associated with disease. In fact, Dr. George Kunosh at the National Institutes for Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse has written that modulating the endocannabinoid system may hold therapeutic promise for a broad range of diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory disorders, obesity, metabolic syndrome. I, I mean, think, again, going back to cannabis, activating this system, giving you the munchies, there's now evidence that people with metabolic syndrome have an overactive endocannabinoid tone, maybe because they're eating so many foods rich in omega-6, we have a, you know, the standard American diet, rich in omega-6, depleted in omega-3s, all of those omega-6s are flooding the brain, creating endocannabinoids that bind to the receptor and give you munchies. French fries are giving you munchies, who knows, right? So there's a lot of therapeutic potential here, and there are pharmaceutical companies that are 
researching drugs that are designed to specifically target various aspects of endocannabinoid system for help with any one of these disease states. And that's not just plant cannabinoids. Of course, medical cannabis uh, appears to be effective in pain, in um, you know, certain types of cancers and neurodegeneration, but there is a lot more research to be done. So I mentioned, you know, the endocannabinoids are mostly involved in cell-to-cell -cell signaling uh, in paracrine and autocrine matters. And basically what happens is that they're synthesized on demand from the available lipids within uh, one cell's lipid bilayer. And then they're released and uh, into the synaptic junction, uh, whichever endocannabinoid is produced like anandamide or sometimes PEA, where they bind to the transmembrane uh, G protein coupled receptors. And then they're taken up uh, back into the cell and degraded by enzymes and then uh, become uh, free fatty acids where they can be reincorporated into another pathway. THC, the major ingredient in cannabis that is associated with euphoria and getting high, does not bind to CB1 very strongly. It's a partial agonist, but it binds to CB1 receptor much longer. And because it binds to that receptor and kind of activates it more thoroughly, it leads for you to have a more, you know, a high effect. Whereas anandamide, even though it binds to that receptor more tightly, uh, is also taken up very, very quickly. Now, CBD does not bind to either of these receptors. Instead, CBD might disrupt the way in which uh, some of these endocannabinoids are degraded, therefore improving overall endocannabinoid tone without getting somebody high. And I, again, I want to illustrate that this is not just about plant cannabinoids, that even mainstream over-the-counter pain medicines work on the endocannabinoid system. So this is really uh, interesting, is that uh, one of the ways in which Tylenol works, acetaminophen, is that it's broken down into uh, P-aminophenol, and then that aminophenol basically uh, recombines with arachidonic acid and forms this molecule, AM404, which looks a lot like anandamide. And AM404 can bind to CB1 receptors, and that's one of the ways in which it reduces pain through endocannabinoid tone. Uh, in fact, in the study over here, they found that uh, in mice, that have a genetic mutation in cannabinoid receptors, it's a, a CB1 knockout model for mice, they do not receive any analgesic um, benefit or anti-analgesic benefit from, um, from Tylenol at all. So it, it appears that cannabinoid receptors are prerequisite for some painkillers that are even over the counter to work. It's not just about plant cannabinoids. We've been talking a lot about the brain but I also want to highlight uh, the immune regulation component because let's take our cross section of the intestinal uh, lining over here, intestinal epithelium. Uh, there are cannabinoid receptors uh, present in the intestinal epithelium in the gut associated lymphoid tissue on mast cells that are present uh, adjacent to the gut. On macrophages, uh, there are cannabinoid receptors. Whoops, I went the wrong way. And uh, these cannabinoid receptors can control the fate of the release of inflammatory cytokines and reduce uh, their expression. So this is one of the ways in which cannabinoids can alter immune function is simply by binding to receptors on immune cells and limiting those immune cells release of various immunogenic factors. Now, as we transition into the immune system, of course, the immune system is uh, very, very complicated. Um, the immune system is where intuition goes to die. That's not my quote. That's, uh, I think, Vincent Racaniello said that on This Week in Virology. And, you know, so we're going to be talking about the immune system and how endocannabinoids might work within the immune system. Uh, note that, you know, a lot of this is still uh, being researched. A lot of this is being speculated on. But especially as where we can think of as stress impacting the immune system, where nutrition can be used to build up the immune system, I want to start to introduce some products for you. And I apologize if this sounds like a sales pitch, um, but you know, CV Sciences is really excited 
to introduce two new products that we think interfaces with the endocannabinoid system of the immune system without containing any cannabis molecules like CBD in there whatsoever. So first I'm going to talk about CB defense and some of the nutrients that are present in CB defense. This is a daily immune formula meant to be taken prophylactically. It's doctor formulated. Uh, we have an innovation team at CB Sciences that I'm grateful to be a part of. Um, however, one of the major drivers of this innovation team is uh, Dr. Duffy Mackay, uh, who some of you may know. Um, uh, Dr. Duffy uh, used to be vice president for the Council of Responsible Nutrition. Uh, he's currently my boss at CB Sciences. Um, he's a really fun guy to talk to. And uh, what we did here is combine a couple of key nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, selenium, reishi mushroom extract, organic reishi extract, together with PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide, that endocannabinoid-like molecule that we produce in our body. Most endocannabinoids that you produce in your body, like anandamide, you cannot ingest. Well, you could, it would just get broken down in the gut. Anandamide, you can't put in a capsule and swallow it and it'll get into your brain or anything like that. But PEA does absorb intact. And PEA appears to be a pretty profound supplement when used every day. It has a, perhaps a, almost 40 different human clinical trials. Most of them are focused on uh, pain management, but there's a couple of really good studies focusing on immune health, and we're gonna talk about those. The intention behind CB defense is uh, formulating it uh, for barrier defense, barrier immunity, innate immunity, and adaptive immunity. So we're looking at something that can kind of nurture and immunogenically support multiple aspects of the immune system through these nutrients. I mean, I'm a huge fan of selenium because I'm so interested in boosting glutathione levels in the body. Um, my master's thesis was on antioxidant gene expression, uh, so something that I feel really tied to. Um, and when it comes to PEA, there's a lot of history behind this ingredient. Uh, I'm not just a science nerd, I also deeply love history, so I kind of want to take you a little bit on uh, this historical tour of how this ingredient was really first thought up and discovered. So let's go to the year of 1939. 1939, the United States is still dealing with the Great Depression. It's coming out of it, but there's a lot of poor, impoverished children living in cramped New York City apartments that catch rheumatic fever uh, or catch infections that lead to symptoms such as rheumatic fever. And the bacteriologists Coburn and Moore discovered that feeding dried egg yolk to these children was significant in reducing their rheumatic fever. And that actually, even if they caught some type of infectious pathogen, their symptoms didn't present as strongly if they're fed dried egg yolk. And Coburn and Moore suggested that, well, perhaps it's possible that um, you know, the escape from poverty and good nutrition means that these children have a stronger immune system or that there's something in these egg yolks that these kids can't otherwise afford to eat that has a uh, immune boosting or uh, immunomodulatory property. Now also, 1939, uh, a lot of stuff was happening in the world. And 1939, uh, you know, World War II was looming on the horizon in Europe. So across the Atlantic Ocean, I want to introduce for you Dr. Rita Levi Montalcini, a brilliant physician scientist who just lost her job at the University of Turin uh, due to uh, Benito Mussolini's um, manifesto of race, is what he called it, a racist law banning uh, Jews from academic positions, among other uh, features in Italian society. At the height of World War II, Dr. Rita Levi Montalcini fled with her family to live with some uh, non-Jewish uh, family friends in uh, the city of Florence, in, in Firenze. And what she did was uh, hide away in um, this building, but, but she set up a laboratory. She was committed to continue her research on how uh, she was using uh, chicken embryos to, to study the nervous system. 
And this research during World War II, while she was hiding away, ultimately led for the foundation of research that would help her win the Nobel Prize in 1986 for the discovery of nerve growth factor. So really important for our understanding of the nervous system, brilliant neurologist. Um, while she was uh, in, in, in studying during this time in World War II, she would assist the Italian resistance uh, fighters, the partisans, um, and, and she survived this and led to leave a really full life. Uh, she lived to be 103 years old. And that's a really cool story, but what does that have to do with Coburn and Moore in America feeding dried egg yolks to children? PEA. That's where these stories combine. How? Let me explain. Now, PEA was discovered, the molecule was discovered in 1957, and they found it in dried egg yolk. And researchers found that PEA had all these anti-allergic effects, and they found that, you know, they were using guinea pigs as a model, as anti-inflammatory. Um, and, and Colburn actually went back in, in the early 60s and said, well, isn't that interesting? I wonder if this is what was in the dried egg yolks that was making those children uh, feel better in, in 1939. Now, again, kind of like how CBD and THC were discovered in the 60s and then they didn't know how it worked until endocannabinoid system was discovered in 1992, Dr. Rita Levi Montalcini in 1993 was the person along with her laboratory that discovered how PEA works in the body. And I think it's really, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that she discovered how PEA works right around the same time that Dr. Mishulam discovered how a very similar molecule, anandamide, works and that anandamide exists. Um, Dr. Uh, Levi Montalcini found that PEA is produced by mast cells as a way of regulating mast cell release of histamine. It can be thought of that PEA is not just an endocannabinoid-like molecule, but also an endogenous antihistamine, if you will. And because of the PEA's role at mast cells, this is perhaps one of the reasons why it's so uh, efficacious in you know, fibromyalgia. That's where a lot of the studies are on in pain because mast cells appear to be upregulated in various forms of peripheral pain issues, uh, fibromyalgia, mast cell activation syndrome, and so on and so forth. Her laboratory continued to characterize the way in which a lot of these fatty acid amides can regulate various receptors that lead to controlling immune function. And what we know now is that PA works in a couple of ways, uh, activates nuclear receptors such as uh, uh, PPARs, and works on the orphan receptor GPR55, which might someday soon be reclassified as cannabinoid receptor 3. And PEA also disrupts the enzymatic degradation of endocannabinoids, anandamide, and 2-AG. So it works in a lot of potential different ways. Now, PEA, I think, is a little bit more popular among integrative medicine circles and naturopathic circles than it is in your kind of more consumer health food store circles. Um, it's not very well known. And I'm not quite sure why that is. And if I were to have to speculate, it, it, uh, I mean, this is just me making up a story for the sake of having a story. It, it might have kind of gotten locked behind the Iron Curtain a little bit, which is maybe why we haven't heard of it as much, possibly also because the science is really complicated, endocannabinoid system is still being researched. But um, the story goes that in the 1970s, there was actually a, uh, a pharmaceutical company that was producing PEA as a drug, and they marketed this drug as impulsive, and it was found all throughout Central Europe. So here's kind of a, a German box for it, uh, Frische und Aktivität durch, right? So whatever. It's like, here's this PEA drug, and in uh, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic in 1974, they enrolled thousands of people in a study that probably could have only been, have been done in the East Bloc. I mean, imagine the Skoda Motor Works. This is like this massive factory in the heart of Central Europe. 
And uh, here at this factory, they produce uh, you know, T-55 main battle tanks, and they produce cars and cranes and all sorts of industrial material. And what they did is basically say, okay, you there, you're going to take this pill. And it was a placebo. You there, you're going to take this pill. And it was a PEA. <laughs> and they basically tracked all these workers, um, you know, up to 4,000 people uh, were involved in these studies and basically saw, okay, were these people coming into work? How were they responding throughout the flu season? Did they have sore throats? Uh, how was their cough? So on and so forth. And it was actually found that compared to placebo, PEA prophylactic treatment dramatically reduced a number of different symptoms, especially fever, headache, and sore throat related to cold and flu symptoms. So between 1972 and 1977, almost 4,000 subjects completed six different placebo-controlled trials, uh, of which almost 2,000 received between 300 milligrams and 1,800 milligrams of PEA every single day. Uh, it was noted that PEA had a strong safety profile. Uh, one of the major scientists, Kachlich, stated that no side effects were registered after several years of clinical testing in these communities. Um, and also, Cochlick speculated that the effects of PA had a clear advantage over certain antivirals and maybe even vaccines in uh, immune prophylaxis. So I think that that's uh, pretty compelling. Now, there haven't been as many studies since on PEA and immune health, although actually this is purely educational. This is just for your information. I remember seeing a news article a couple months ago where they had, uh, there was a pharmaceutical company that wanted to start studying and maybe entered into phase one uh, PEA for COVID. And again, purely educational. I think that's just something that I had read. So I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about this uh, ingredient in CV Defense. We have the storied kind of historical, um, really interesting science backed ingredient that really isn't being used for this purpose yet. Uh, and so I'm grateful for this partnership with Fullscript because I think it has a lot of potential use. Okay, so I want to switch over to um, introducing for you another product that CV Sciences is coming out with. Uh, there's some more science surrounding this, and this is based on a traditional Chinese medicinal formula. And even though it's based on historical traditional herbal medicine, there might still be a role for endocannabinoid system in this product. Again, all apologies if this feels like you're being sold to. I just want to introduce you some of these concepts. CV Acute is specifically formulated to take three times a day for three days, and then it's done. The bottle is empty. It's to take it, to nip it in the bud when you feel like you need it. It's based on a traditional Chinese medicinal formula. I'm gonna try to pronounce the name. I apologize if I butchered the pronunciation. Anybody can correct me that knows better. Uh, I believe it is pronounced Shuang uh, Huang Lian. SHL is this combination of the fruit of forsythia, the root of bicol skullcap, and the flower of honeysuckle. And the combination of these ingredients appears to be very useful for acute immune activity, immunomodulation, antiviral activities, and anti-inflammatory activities. This is all plant-based. This is a formula that is used in hospitals in China. They've actually made it an injectable drug over there since it appears to work so well. Um, however, there are some studies that suggest that taking it internally as a liquid are almost as good as injecting it. Just briefly, traditional Chinese medicine has evolved over the course of thousands of years. It's based on lifestyle, diet, herbalism, acupuncture, manual therapy. By the way, acupuncture, the, the act of inserting needles into certain acupuncture points is associated with alterations in endocannabinoid tone. Might be one of the reasons why acupuncture helps with pain. Specifically though, Traditional Chinese medicine was modernized in the 1960s, and that's when you're seeing this formula, uh, SHL, being 
established that the herbs in SHL, Bicol, Skullcap, Honeysuckle, et cetera, have been used for thousands of years, but this combination in this way was really assembled in the 1960s, and they applied all this modern science to that formula. Even the World Health Organization has recognized the potential for traditional Chinese medicine in curbing uh, the SARS outbreak in 2003, as well as the avian flu and, and swine flu outbreaks in, in China. And in their report on these outbreaks, the World Health Organization did cite this SHL formula. Now, I know that the community I'm speaking to right now tends to be a little bit more uh, friendly towards um, some of these modalities like traditional Chinese medicine. For people that do tend to be more skeptical, I always like to point out uh, the work of Tu Yo Yo. And I think this is really fascinating that, that Tu Yo Yo, she does not have a PhD, but she won the Nobel Prize in 2015 because she was involved in the efforts in the 1960s to modernize traditional Chinese medicine and ultimately was key in discovering artemisinin from artemisia, from sweet wormwood, and is now, this is a pharmaceutical drug that's available all across the world as an essential medicine for uh, malaria, and that it was her contributions that led to that. And so I like to point out that, that her gift of kind of translating traditional Chinese medicine to the rest of the world kind of occurred around the same time that SHL was formulated and researched for imm immunomodulatory, activities, antiviral activities, and anti-inflammatory activities. So again, it's only authentic SHL if it has the flower of honeysuckle, the root of bicol skull cap, and the fruit of forsythia. And that the combination of these herbs work in a number of different ways cellularly. Now these are all full plant extracts, meaning that there's hundreds of different phytonutrients, flavonoids, polyphenolics, um, polysaccharides, etc., that might be present within these compounds, I'm sorry, within these plants, compounds within these plants. But I wanted to pick out three that I thought were very well researched and sort of fascinating by their way of having or exerting direct antiviral activities, immunomodulatory activities, and anti-inflammatory activities. Honeysuckle contains something called microRNA2911. What is that? <laughs> well, microRNA are small non-coding fragments of RNA. When I say non-coding, unlike messenger RNA, which gets coded and translated into peptides and proteins, microRNA do not, that our cells produce microRNA to have a regulatory role uh, to sort of reduce the expression um, uh, or a translation of certain messenger RNA into peptides and proteins. And it turns out that honeysuckle has a microRNA piece that can actually absorb digestion, that can absorb decoction into a traditional formula, gets into the body, and exerts a number of different antiviral effects. It's really quite fascinating. Most microRNA are not thought to in, be ingestible from foods. Most of the time, it's a studied phenomenon uh, that's endogenous. So I like the idea that honeysuckle might have some of this magic, some of this antiviral effect through this very unique compound over here. Okay, so then there's uh, bicolane. And uh, bicolane is a flavonoid uh, from bicol skull cap. And it is associated with um, blocking entry of the virus into the cell, blocking exit, it's a neuraminidase inhibitor. Uh, it also has a lot of anti-inflammatory activities, blocks NF-kappa B, uh, promotes short-chain fatty acid production by the gut microbiome. It has a lot of really uh, cool functions. It's a very cool molecule, I find. And then uh, forsythin. Uh, forsythin is a molecule that is found in forsythia. And there's studies that show that if you treat cells and rodents with forsythin, that it protects them from induced damage in the lungs by H1N1, influenza, and other types of infectious viruses. It has an antioxidant effect, and it, it spares the lungs, um, lung cells from uh, damage due to viruses. So in the kind of classic schematic of uh, viral entry, 
into the cell and replication and then exit, um, I kind of like to highlight that bicolin, bicolin can uh, block entry, kind of like how there's been discussion lately of uh, quercetin and other flavonoids as inhibiting or acting as antagonists at some of the receptor sites that viruses use to enter the cell. Bicolin appears to also be involved with this process. Bicolin also blocks the enzymes that the virus uses to exit cells. Um, and then internally, microRNA-2911 would inhibit um, the messenger RNA that the virus dumps in order to uh, assemble or to hijack the cell's translated, uh, translation uh, machinery to make uh, more copies of the virus. CB Sciences uh, is using our best practices when it comes to quality control in bringing this herbal formula to the United States in a respectable manner. Um, it is actually a registered natural health product in Canada, the ingredient that we're using. Uh, there is no heavy metals detected in the product, uh, no Prop 65 uh, warning on the label. So I really feel confident that this is something that you can use for your health and your patient's health in acute immune situations. In the clinical research, when you go to PubMed and you type in uh, Shuang Honglian, uh, there is a lot of research that does demonstrate a reduction in symptoms associated with cough or, or fever uh, or wheezing when people are taking uh, this ingredient. We're almost at the end here. Um, where I wanted to tie this back into endocannabinoid activity is that we've talked a lot about kind of the classic ways in which endocannabinoid system can be modulated. Fatty acids, right? And the plant cannabinoids, CBD, THC. And then PEA, right? This endocannabinoid-like molecule that you can ingest and it modulates the, the receptors and modulates the processes. Um, you know, there's a number of ways in which you can feed the endocannabinoid system, which is important for balancing, balancing the relationship between stress and immune activity. This paper by Dr. John McPartland, um, Dr. Jeffrey Gee, and Vincenzo DiMarzo talks about alternative strategies for feeding endocannabinoid tone. And it involves fiber, probiotics, exercise, acupuncture, and they highlight flavonoids as potential endocannabinoid system mediators. That the Mediterranean diet, rich in olive oil, can upregulate endocannabinoids, not because of the omega 9s in olive oil, but because the polyphenolics in the olive oil can regulate certain aspects of endocannabinoid system. Bicolin might, therefore, as a flavonoid, work on endocannabinoids too. And bicolin works on some of, some of the uh, downstream acosinoid pathways. I believe it's an inhibitor of one of the enzymes that's involved with leukotriene synthesis. So for this reason, there's a lot of, of ways in which we can suspect that the ingredients in CV acute don't just work uh, in that kind of classic antiviral manner, but also might interact with the endocannabinoid system too. So folks, when it comes to these new products, these are non-redundant complements. They work great alongside vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, elderberry extracts, but they work in different ways. They work through supporting endocannabinoid tone. They work through supporting various aspects of the stress immune relationship. So I'm pretty enthusiastic about the fact that we get to formulate these and bring them out and work with full script in getting them to you. So thank you very much for listening to this. Full script, thank you very much for hosting this lecture. I hope that you found this uh, informational. If you like listening to me about this, if you want more information like this, please go to CV Sciences on YouTube. My previous job description before the pandemic hit involved traveling every other week, giving lectures at doctor's offices and conferences, so on and so forth. I can't do that anymore. So a lot of what I get to do now involves giving lectures virtually, and we're recording a lot of videos. So go to YouTube, like and subscribe. Please check that out. And if you like this, but maybe you didn't quite like listening to me, please check out our uh, one of our naturopathic advisors, Dr. Jamie Caroon, on his take on PEA. That is a YouTube video on CV Sciences on YouTube. So that is what I'm going to ask you to do. 
and think about ways in which you can support your endocannabinoid tone, your patient's endocannabinoid tone, and their health through supplementation with all sorts of what we already know is good for us, probiotics, mega fats, but also lifestyle, exercise, eating brightly colored fruits and vegetables, meditation, and then when it's appropriate to do so, incorporating PEA. And when it's appropriate to do so, incorporating SHL in the form of CB Sciences immune products. Thank you so much for listening today. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Miles. That was awesome. Very entertaining. We got a lot of great feedback. Um, a couple questions came through, so we can go through those if we have a little more time. Um, so uh, one of the first questions that came through was, what can you tell us about essential oils and the endocannabinoid system? Word on the street is that, I'm probably going to say this wrong, Copaiba, Copaiba specifically activates the cannabinoid system, but they would like to learn your take on essential oils, I guess. Absolutely, yes. So essential oils, of course, are rich in small molecules, a lot of terpenoids, okay? And these terpenoids are thought to complement the function of cannabinoids. So if you've studied cannabis medicine at all, you might know that different strains of cannabis um, have different fragrances and flavors, and that's because of the terpenoids that the plant can make. So some of those terpenoids can directly bind to some of the cannabinoid receptors. In particular, um, beta-caryophylline is a terpenoid that's found in the essential oil that you mentioned, um, and it's thought to bind to the CB2 receptor, not the CB1 receptor. Now, CB2 receptor is mostly involved with immune activity. Uh, so it's thought that this essential oil might be potential for reducing inflammation by containing this terpenoid beta-caryophylline that reduces inflammation through this pathway. Uh, it does not bind to the CB1 receptor, which is why you don't get high off of that essential oil. Um, now, a lot of these essential oils also can kind of complement the function of cannabinoids, but don't directly interact with the endocannabinoid system. So for example, if you have a cannabis plant and it has a lavender-like fragrance and may it contains a lot of linalool, uh, which is one of these terpenoids that's relaxing because it binds to GABA uh, receptors in the brain, then that can certainly impact the quality of your high if, if you're smoking a THC-rich cannabis plant that also has this la linalool, uh, lavender-like fragrance. Um, but it doesn't, that linalool isn't going to directly activate cannabinoids receptors like THC would. Uh, and so, and uh, actually, just got another coming. What was the name of that essential oil again that you? Um, well, I think it was in the question, right? It was, it was. Yeah, um, copaiba. Copaiba. Yeah. So A I B A. Was there a different one? I'm not sure if there's a different one they're asking. So, so but that's I think copaiba is the plant, and then the terpenoid in that essential oil is beta caryophylline, which you also find in black seed oil. And you find it in clove and, and even in holy basil. Okay. Um, yeah, great. And then according to um, one of the slides you had up, cytokines are affected by the endocannabinoids. Are there any trials regarding COVID-19 deadly cytokine stroms? Stroms? I'm not Storms. Sure. Storms? Um, or are they just, yes. <laughs> I don't um, know if they're spelling um, mistake or anything. So there's, yeah, I mean, again, it, it, the research is very limited. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there's any studies going on in Israel right now. You know, Dr. Rafael Mishulam was based out of Hebrew University. So a lot of the cannabis medicine studies are based in um, Israel when they're actually using the plant. Uh, the United States is really lagging behind um, Canada is just starting to catch up now. My old laboratory um, transformed from a smoke inhalation toxicology lab into a cannabis medicine lab um, yeah. in McGill in Montreal. Um, but the, uh, uh, the short answer is not hugely. There were a couple of studies that came out of, I think, Calgary that had shown that in vitro, which doesn't mean very much, unfortunately. In cell culture, CBD and THC-rich whole plant extracts could reduce certain types of viral load and inflammatory levels. Um, but that, you know, 
that wasn't even peer reviewed yet. The scientist, Igor Kovalchuk, was so excited by his research, he put it out into pre-press pre before getting it peer reviewed. So we're kind of limited in that aspect. Now, don't get, um, you know, what we do know is that um, certain cannabis medicines can reduce inflammatory cytokines in other disease states. So it's possible, but International Cannabinoid Research uh, Society um, specifically said at the beginning of the pandemic, look, we don't know. We, they don't have the studies. Don't say either way. Don't say it's either bad or good for it. We just don't know yet. Yeah, too, kind of too early or too fast. Right. And... But um, I mean, if anything, with, with PEA, I think that that's where we can be a little bit more encouraged because you do have those studies from the 70s that show general immune prophylaxis um, and general people feeling increased wellness when it comes to um, you know seasonal types of infections. Mm -hmm. um, so this I guess is more directed at like the immune supplements but um, mm -hmm. we had a question come through is can you explain why they add um, reishi or reishi mushrooms to immune supplements? Sure um, and I I think reishi mushroom is a wonderful mushroom. It's it's um, reishi mushroom contains uh, these polysaccharides known as uh, beta glucans. It also contains a number of steroidal triterpenoids, and both of these types of compounds exert different roles in the immune system. Um, that might be immunomodulatory. They can support natural killer cell function. To be honest, in terms of the formula, it's only a small amount of reishi mushroom. Um, I think that if somebody were specifically looking for a reishi supplement, I would probably recommend just a reishi extract by itself. But I think as a daily prophylaxis type of product with the PEA, with the other vitamins and minerals, it does make sense for me just to add a little bit of that extra, uh, maybe NK cell activation activity. Yeah. Um, and is PEA in normal dietary egg or must it be dried? I know you were saying. That's a great question. Yeah. And I would suspect that, well, first off, I don't know for sure, but okay. if I were to take an educated guess, it would be present in uh, raw eggs and dried eggs and scrambled eggs. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also found in peanuts, it's found in alfalfa, and it is found in your own body. Okay. Um, you might have also touched on this already too, but which of your products may be helpful for immune systems suppressed by mold? Virginia. That's a great, so I actually did not bring up mold. Um, and I personally dealt with mold when I was going through grad school. I was living in a moldy basement. I was really uh, sick. And I know what I had to do, you know, I had eczema, depression, brain fog, the works. And what I needed to do was go on probiotics, clean up my diet, take all these botanicals. Um, if I had known at the time, I would have absolutely included something like a PEA into uh, my diet or into my supplement regime at the time. And the reason for that is that mold can often trigger uh, mast cells. And a lot of the allergies that people experience when they're dealing with a moldy room uh, has to do with mast cell overactivation. So PEA by restraining mast cells, I believe could be part of the puzzle in somebody looking to conquer their mold. If it's the answer by itself, I can't say for sure, but I think it's part of uh, your toolkit. Yeah. Okay. And then any evidence CBD can help with steroid side effects? Ooh, um, <laughs> that one I'm unclear of. Um, what I would suggest is that um, if somebody is using steroids or they're prescribed steroids to reduce chronic inflammation, is that there may be some rationale for using cannabis medicines, including CBD, uh, to limit inflammation perhaps so that they can switch to um, or, or taper off their dose of certain types of medications that are so um, immunolo immunologically repressive like um, steroidals. Yeah, um, one more, it might be like a deeper conversation and I think was actually asked closer to the beginning of your presentation. Um, if the terrain determines the possibility of catching a disease, are you really catching anything is what they've asked. <laughs> That is a, a very, it's almost a, a metaphysical question, right? <laughs> yes. And, and um, you know, I, I love this idea of hormesis is sort of a phenomenon in toxicology whereby 
low doses of toxins have strengthening effects. And, um, you know, on, on some level, like, like ionizing radiation, too much of it will zap you, you know, Chernobyl, whatever. But like low doses have a strengthening effect and can have an anti-cancer effect. Uh, you know, radon miners in Sweden um, are very healthy. <laughs> Who knows? Who knew? Right? So it's kind of like um, there's been a part of me, if like I zoom out on, uh, and I kind of like stop getting lost in the forest or in the trees and start to look at the whole forest, sometimes I think, what if certain viruses are good for us? Mm -hmm. That by, by like, like by catching a common cold, strengthens our immune system absolutely right like maybe sitting in bed for a week sick not eating much and drinking a lot of water is what your body needs to detox now i'm saying still stay healthy do everything you can to avoid catching a serious bug wear your mask but that's that's an idea that i'll, I'll pull out push out there for you yeah Oh, that was great. That um, basically, I think that covers our questions. We had a lot of um, um, people thanking and also asking for the recording. So um, very engaged and wanting to take the time to go over the webinar after and check out the slides and presentation again. So I will um, mention that I think you've mentioned too that we will be sending the recording to all registrants um, after the event today, and it'll live on Full Scripts webinars website um, fullscript.com slash webinars so you can go back and watch it there anytime um, i'd love to the, thank miles and cv sciences for being here with us today um, it was amazing i learned a lot too um, and there is much more to learn i'm sure so hopefully we can continue doing this in the future as well thank you so much i would love another opportunity with full script like this thank you all right well thank you and everyone um, take care and have a great rest of the day thank you take care